good morning, Trinity family. We are so glad that you are here this morning on this cold April day. Um, everyone keeps joking with me. I'm the Floridian. I'm like, what is happening? Like, why is it so cold? Uh, but we are so, so happy that you are here today. Before we get started with worship, we do want to give a couple of announcements so that you guys know what is going on. You will want to sign into the Church Center app. The Church Center app has so many details, it has so many functions that will help you get plugged in, get connected. You can sign up there for a small group. You can find out what events are going on at Trinity, and we can see who was here this weekend and just know that you were here and be able to welcome you that way. If you are new and you haven't been here before, or maybe it's your first or second time, we do have Starbucks gift cards available for you in the lobby, so go out there after service and check it out. Go to the front desk and they will get you plugged in, but we are just so happy that you're here. Again, we are very, very excited. We want to be able to give away a book confronting Christianity to anyone who is spiritually curious. So if you're wondering, what is Christianity all about? You've been attending Trinity and you're still getting plugged in. We would love to be able to connect you with this book by Rebecca McLaughlin called Confronting Christianity. And that is something that we would love to be able to give to you. Now, we have our e-news. If you are not plugged into our e-news, that is something that you will want to get. I am, and I'm going to say this in grace, I am addicted to my email. I always check it. I'm always looking like, what is going on? And one thing that is so helpful for me is I get the e-news every single Saturday and it helps me see, oh yeah, that's going on this weekend. Okay, that is what's happening. And so if you're not connected with our e-news, please do. All you need to do is get connected in our Church Center app and you are automatically signed up for our e-news. So it's super easy and you don't need to worry about you know filling out any forms or anything like that, putting your email in a million different places. You will get signed in when you get plugged into the Church Center app. Now, another announcement we have is our small group training. That is going to be happening April 28th and April 29th. So that's this coming weekend. And this is an event that's open to everyone. But when I first got here, I was like, oh, small group training. So that's only for the small group leaders and people that are plugged into a small group. But that's not true. This is something that's for everyone. It's something that you can go to and just see what we'll be doing in our next series. We will be studying from Ephesians, and it's going to be a great study. And so you'll be able to go and hear more from some special speakers and just get excited and ramped up for that. So before I keep talking, let's watch a video to help us get revved up for our small group training. And I asked myself the question, what was it about that community that made that so powerful. It was just an amazing experience to feel that connection and to know that God was calling me to do something more. And I sing hallelujah, fully forgiven, fully accepted, fully restored in the new definition declared by salvation and all of the glory belongs to the Lord. God has given us an incredible gift of grace, and in response to that grace, we give to his kingdom. The early church got that. What is God's word now for us? How do we see our lives being wrapped up and drawn into the greater story that God is writing in history? How can we be a part of it? So you'll be able to drop off your kids, spend a day in fellowship and learning more from God's word, and it's going to be a really great opportunity. Now again, before we get started, what Sally said is that generosity is our response to God's grace in our lives. And so if you would like to give to Trinity or um, give in that way, there are three ways that you can do that. You can give through our Church Center app, you can give online at tlcforyou.org, or you can give in the envelopes in the boxes that you'll find in the back of the worship service. So again, thank you guys so much. Would you please stand and worship with us? And if you're worshiping from home, we are excited that you're here. But let's begin our service in joy and worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who is. 
house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord
pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much that we actually can raise a hallelujah to you. You have given us the freedom and the joy that comes from worshiping you, sending everything you had, all your love for me, for all of us. And God, I thank you for that opportunity to continue to worship you. I thank you for the gifts that you've given. Even though there was nothing that I ever did to deserve any of that, but you chose me. You chose us. Thank you, God, for all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. 
Old Church, would you take a moment to greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ? Good morning. Our first reading today comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Our second reading comes from Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 14. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders with the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So ends today's reading. So in 2013, a post went up on Facebook following the shooting death of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman. It was a very simple post. It was one person ex expressing their heartache over the tragic death of yet another young black life. The post simply read this, Black people, I love you. I love us. Our lives matter. Another person commenting on the post said this, Declaration, black, black bodies will no longer be sacrificed for the rest of the world's enlightenment. I am done. I'm so done. Trayvon, you are loved infinitely. Hashtag black lives matter. That simple hashtag, that simple phrase would have massive societal impact over the following years. One, an impact that I'm sure the original posters and writers didn't even intend to start. It was this movement that became Black Lives Matter. Over the years, as the nation watched the tragic deaths of people like Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and George Floyd, people started to come together around this phrase to declare Black Lives are important, Black Lives Matter. What started as a simple post became a movement, and now today it's coalesced into an organization, the Black Lives Matter organization, which is dedicated to raising issues of race and racial injustice to the forefront of our consciousness today as a society. 
but it's also a phrase that has become a lightning rod and a polarizing one. Now a statement, not so much of collective mourning, but a statement declaring where you fall on a political spectrum and what you think about this political issue. As a result, it's become a difficult conversation to have. Many people aren't sure what to say when someone says Black Lives Matter. Other people are baffled why more people aren't saying it. And that's exactly the reason why we need to talk about it. You see, we started this series, Secular Creeds, because there is a conversation happening in our wider society in which people are staking out, quite literally in their lawns, what it is they believe. That's what a creed is. It's simply a statement of our fundamental beliefs. And we call it secular creeds because these are conversations that aren't just happening in the church. They're happening out in the wider society, in the wider world. And so our question as a church is how do we as people of faith step into these difficult conversations? More specifically, how do we step into these conversations in a way that points people to Jesus? And as you've guessed, this week we're going to be talking about Black Lives Matter. And as I said in the first week of our series, I, I think it's worth saying again, there are far too many people, far too many Christians who read their Bibles through a political lens, and our desire is to start to read our politics through a biblical one. And so I want to say that again as we dive into this conversation because of the fact that this statement has led to so many different kinds of political responses. And so the journey that we're going to take today is we're going to look at what God's word has to say how it informs us and helps us to wrestle with issues of race and conversations around injustice. Now, I recognize we're, we're biting off a lot in this series, that these are complex issues, and I'm under no illusions that I'm going to be able to really explain it all or dive into it in just 20 minutes. But my prayer, my hope, is that it at least, at the very least, helps us to start to think differently about these topics and to step into the conversation in a way that brings the grace, love, and kingdom of God wherever we find ourselves having these kinds of discussions. So let's go to God's word. Let's see what it actually has to say. One of the things that I find so powerful is how the Bible reminds us that we live between two incredible realities. The very first reality that it reminds us of is found in the very first chapter of Scripture, Genesis chapter 1, where it speaks about God creating the heavens and the earth and everything that dwells therein. And at the very end of the creation account, we read these words from our Creator. He says this, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The very first pages of scripture, we read that God created humanity to be his image bearers, to be the ones who represent him and his character and his goodness and his love to the rest of creation, to join with him in the work of caring for and stewarding that creation. And the earliest picture that we get of humanity is of this beautiful community bound up by the love of God, dwelling with him in paradise as they steward his creation together. And that takes us to the very end of the Bible, the other reality that we live in between. That when we see the final picture of what God is going to do, of the new creation that he's going to bring, this is what we read. That the Apostle John, receiving this incredible vision from God of what will ultimately be brought to completion when God comes again to make all things new, he sees this. He says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. One of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? 
I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not be down on them nor any scorching heat for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The final picture that John gets is of a beautiful community dwelling in the presence of God, where there's no longer any more weeping, tears, or injustice anymore. And what John tells us is that they are people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, I want to pause here and just ask a question. How does John know that? It may seem like an obvious question, but really stop and think about it. How does he know that these are people from every tribe, tongue, and nation? Well, the simple answer is because he sees them He sees them in all of their beautiful diversity, all their various skin tones and colors. He hears them. He hears them praising God in their own languages, in ways reflective of their cultures. Is this beautiful, multi-ethnic picture of the people of God. See, Scripture tells us that we dwell between these two realities— This reality that tells us that every single human being is an image bearer of God, there is an inherent unity among the human race. And yet that unity is expressed most fully and most beautifully actually in our diversity. Our diversity isn't a liability, it's actually a gift that's brought into God's kingdom that we better reflect the image of God to all creation together in all of our own diverse and beautiful array. This is God's intention for humanity, for the human community, for the human family. But the truth is, we live between these two realities. And what we find between these two realities and what is the subject of the rest of the Bible is that although that's how what God's original intention was when he created us and what he will ultimately bring to its fulfillment on the day he makes all things new, that that has been endangered. It's been broken by human sin and selfishness. As you read through the pages of Scripture, what we find is that human beings continually exalt themselves over God. And the result of this is that it actually leads to a breakdown, not only in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with each other. That not only do we spurn him in whose image we are made, but we actually take advantage of our fellow image bearers, seeing our differences not as a gift, but as a basis for drawing lines and distinctions between us and them. It's what's led to inequalities and exploitation in every human civilization in every age on the face of this earth. This is the problem that we call sin. In fact, one of the things that I really appreciate is the definition of sin that's provided by the Japanese Christian author Shusako Endo. In his book, Silence, he says this. He says, sin is not what it is usually thought to be. It is not to steal and to tell lies. Sin is for one man to walk brutally over the life of another and to be quite oblivious of the wounds that he has left behind. What he highlights is that this tendency to subjugate one another, to see our differences as a problem that needs to be defended against, as something that puts us into a zero-sum game of us versus them, he says all of this is the result of this brokenness and this inward turning of the human heart, one which is down through the ages led to constant civilizations and communities being exploited for the benefit of others. It's touched every single country, every single society on the face of our planet. And in fact, when we go through our U.S. history courses as children, we learn just how deep that's gone in the history of our own country. When the specter of slavery reigned over our land long before we were an independent people and long after. And one of the things that's important to recognize is that 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 brokenness continues to be something that tears us apart and divides us even today. 
It's part of the reason why I'm grateful for the research of Michael Emerson and Christian Smith. When I was a student in seminary, I actually had to read their book, Divided by Faith, Evangelical Religion and the Problem of Race in America. This book was one of the largest sociological studies about the intersection of race and Christian faith in America. And specifically, the writers wanted to know why it was so hard for Christians to talk about race, even when they supposedly share the same religious convictions. And one of the things that they highlight is they highlight the fact that the United States is what is known as a racialized society. And here's what they mean. I want to provide a definition. They said a racialized society is one in which the intermarriage rates are low, residential separation and socioeconomic inequality are the norm, our definitions of personal identity and our choices of intimate associations reveal racial distinctiveness, and where we are never unaware of the race of a person with whom we interact. Finally, the racialized society is evident in religious affiliation choices. See, what they note is that when you think about this definition of what a racialized society is, what we see is that America qualifies. They again look at the data and found that black-white marriages constitute less than one-half of 1% of existing marriages, that residential integration and segregation studies continually show that the degree of segregation between blacks and non-blacks is far greater than between any other two racial groups in the United States, and that generational wealth remains unevenly distributed across racial groups. Furthermore, what they note is that far too many Christians attend churches that are homogenous racially, where the majority of the people in the pews and in the seats look just like them. What they highlight is they say part of the reason it's so hard for Christians to enter into this very, very important conversation is because our religious communities have actually been conditioned by our broken history. They've been conditioned by the ways in which historically we've divided up our communities and our our relationships along racial lines. And they say that until this is addressed and acknowledged, the church will never truly be able to step into these deeper kinds of conversations in ways that really point people to Jesus and to his kingdom. It was a staggering study that really highlighted just how deep this brokenness goes. And that's part of the reason why we have to talk about it here now. Because what we need to do is we need to recapture a biblical vision of who we are if we're truly going to step into these conversations in a way that brings healing, reconciliation, and transformation. And one of the things that I absolutely love is how when we look at the New Testament, it provides us with ways of thinking about who we are as Christians that I think actually help us navigate this very, very complex conversation. In fact, two of the most commonly used metaphors in the New Testament for talking about the church are the metaphors of a family and of a body. Here's what I mean. Take a look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In this chapter, the Apostle Paul is actually addressing a community of Christians who have become divided. They've become divided socioeconomically. They've become divided culturally. They've become divided ethnically. And one of the things that I love that he says is this, just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, it does not belong, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. As it is, there are many parts but one body. And God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. It's this beautiful picture in which he says every single one of us 
Bringing our uniqueness into the body of Christ is exactly what God intends. And there is no part that's greater or lesser. And in fact, if one part is suffering, the others suffer along with it. If one part is honored, the others are likewise honored. It's a total breakdown of this us versus them division. And I love that he uses this metaphor because honestly, when we're sick, we know how true this is. If, I, if a part of my body is injured and bleeding, I don't say, well, that's the arm's problem to figure out and deal with. No, my whole body is involved in making sure that healing is brought to the wound. And likewise, what he says is he says, when we see one part of the body of Christ injured and hurting, the rest of us should rally around it to bring comfort and healing and wholeness. The other metaphor that's often used in the New Testament is that of a family or a household. And again, I want to go to what the Apostle Paul tells us. In his letter to the Galatians, he writes this. He says, In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He says, together, we're family. That through Christ, we recognize that we're a part of a brand new community. A new community that is, yes, indeed, made up of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Bound together by the grace, love, and forgiveness of our God. And again, I think that this is important when we, when we talk about this phrase, Black Lives Matter, because when we start to approach this conversation as members of a family, I think we approach it entirely differently. Let me see if I can give just a family illustration for a second to help understand this. If one of my kids comes home at the end of the day from school and comes up to me and says, Daddy, does my life matter? Me responding with simply, well, honey, all lives matter, doesn't really address their concern. Well, it might be theologically true. Yes, all lives matter because everybody's made in the image of God. That's not really what my kid is asking. What my kid is asking is, do I matter to you? Is my life of value? Do you see me? It should be something that raises an alarm in my mind and in my heart as a parent to wonder what's happening, to really sit back and listen and ask them, what happened at school today and how can I help? And I think that when we start to approach this conversation as family members rather than as political groups or separate communities, it changes the entire dynamic. We have to remember where the phrase Black Lives Matter began. It began as, as one community crying out in pain and lament, not to advance a political cause. And so when we hear that, the question is, do we respond to the way family members should? By slowing down and asking the question, what's going on? How can I help? By being willing to listen and enter into the tough conversations because we care about that individual. But furthermore, we care about that individual's circumstances and what led to their current moment of crisis. I defy any of you to look at a parent who, who uh, sees their child struggling in school and to not see someone who's willing to move heaven and earth to make sure that their kid is okay. <laughs> That when our kids are having a hard time at, in school, we don't just want to know if their teachers like them. We want to know what's going on in the classroom, what the policies are, what the curriculum is, and so on and so forth. We're willing to look at the whole picture and say, how can I make this better for my child and for other kids just like him or just like her? And in the same ways, when we hear part of our community saying Black Lives Matter, it should make us stop and not just ask, what's going on with these people that I personally know, but what's going on in the wider circumstances that led, has led to their pain and their hardship, and what can we do together about it? See, I would encourage us to think about this issue through the lens of family, for that is what Jesus has made us. Because when we approach these conversations as family members, it changes everything. It leads us to a place where we care not just personally, but we care corporately, where we are humble and willing to listen, and likewise gracious and extending forgiveness when someone has hurt us. Furthermore, we all then are willing to work together in ways that bring foretastes of the kingdom of God into our communities and into the places where we live. 
So rather than getting offended when somebody says Black Lives Matter, and rather than becoming resentful when another person responds with All Lives Matter, what if every single one of us slowed down just a moment and actually sat across from one another as members of the body of Christ? as one household, one family, covered by his grace and forgiveness, and said, what's really going on with you? How are you processing this? How can together we bring healing into our broken world, recognizing that we live between these two great realities, where everyone is made in the image of God, and yet it's in our beautiful diversity that that image is best expressed? If we can start there, I think it brings about the kind of transformation that our society desperately needs. But furthermore, we need to be willing to step into the conversation more, which is why I want to encourage you with another resource. One of the conversations that I've really appreciated is the conversation that's taking place in a podcast called The Impartial Church that's put out by Lutheran Hour Ministries. It's described as a hopeful podcast about race, culture, diversity, and the Christian faith, one which acknowledges brokenness in our world but covers it all with the grace and forgiveness of God. What I love about the conversations that they're having there is that they model for us what it means to be Christians entering into this difficult conversation. What it means to reclaim our identity as a family of faith, a family made up of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And to know how best to respond in those moments when someone says Black Lives Matter. To not respond as though we have to defend or attack a political position but to simply enter in as members of a family who when somebody says Black Lives Matter, we're willing to slow down and listen. Ask the question, what's going on and how can I be a part of the solution? To be a people who say, yes, Black Lives Matter. They matter to God and they matter to us. And likewise, when any other community is hurting, to step in as healing hands, bringing the grace and power and forgiveness of Jesus. So that when Latino communities are crying out in need, we can say Latino lives matter. When Asian communities are crying out in need, we can say Asian lives matter. That when any other community is burdened and hurting, we can step in and say, your lives matter to God and we see you. Why? Because they do. Because God sees them. Because Christ sees them. And he calls us to be his people, his body, entering into places of division to bring healing and wholeness in a way that points people ultimately to the beautiful kingdom that he is building and will one day bring to its fullness. But that takes a lot of prayer. That takes a lot of grace. That takes a lot of humility, which is why I want to close this message in a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? God, we live in a world of division, where in our sinfulness, we see diversity as a problem where we see it not as a bridge to a new kind of community, but rather a barrier and a way to justify an us versus them mentality in which we coalesce around these statements simply as political weapons. Lord, forgive us and help us to remember that we are called to be your people, that we are all made as your image bearers to point other people to you and to your goodness and your mercy and your grace. And so, Lord, where there's division, we pray that we as the church would step in to bring healing. Where there's brokenness, Lord, that we as the church would step in to bind up. And that as we dive into these hard conversations, that we would do so with a spirit of grace, forgiveness, and humility that desires to see our, our world more fully reflect your kingdom until the day when you come again and bring it to its fullness. So help us, Lord, to remember that that's who we are, people covered by your grace who bear your name to build a new kind of community that speaks to the beauty of your salvation. It's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. I love that picture from Revelation of that group all around the throne from every tribe and tongue and race and nation. I had a little experience of that myself many, many years ago. I was uh, in Hong Kong and I was at a Lutheran church there in Hong Kong on a Sunday morning and uh, the service was all in Mandarin, so I didn't understand a word of anything that was going on. 
And, uh, and then to make matters worse, they had a guest preacher that morning, and, and he was preaching in Cantonese. And so he was preaching in Cantonese, and there was an interpreter translating into Mandarin for the rest of the room, and then there was an interpreter sitting next to me trying to go from Mandarin to English, and I, honestly, I was so far behind it was a mess. Until right after the message, we all stood and we all said the Apostles' Creed together in three different languages in that room, but we all were confessing the same faith. And that happens every Sunday. Really, when you think about it all over the world, there are people who have gathered in their time zone and they've confessed the same creed together. So I invite you to please stand and we're going to join our voices to theirs and we're going to confess the second article of the Apostles' Creed, this old historic creed of the church, and then use Luther's explanation as we think about what those words mean. Let's confess our faith together. And in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Please be seated. You know, this confession of faith draws us together no matter what race or tribe or people group we are a part of. But there's something else that does that too. Because you see, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way also, after supper, he took a cup of wine, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, and it's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This meal unites us together as believers. Here together we receive the body and blood of our Lord and our Savior Jesus to forgive our sins and to strengthen our faith. And when we commune together now, we say it is a foretaste of the feast to come. In other words, it's a chance to look forward to that day where we will celebrate this meal together in heaven with all believers from all tribes, from all nations, from all races, from all peoples. So if you believe these things as we do, I invite you to come and join together as we commune here in this place this morning. Jesus, this song is forever. 
today know that your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ goes with you. He goes before you to show you the way, beside you to accompany you, behind you to encourage you, above you to protect you, below you to support you. And he goes within you to grant you forgiveness and peace and grace. Have a great Sunday, everybody.